Good afternoon to you all. I am Mishi Chaudhary and I work for the Soccer Freedom Law Center. And uh, I'm, Evan was talked in the morning about this general concept of the entire strategy for commons as an agent for activism. I'm going to just put a legal strategy before you on how does this work on the ground. Am I audible? Yeah. So it's not a very big deal. So I'm going to talk a little about the legal strategy for pro-commons activism, which means having breaking information in the information technology arena and the life sciences. So what is uh, being human if you don't have a culture? And what is a culture if you cannot share it? But it's only in the last 100 to 150 years that we've had this and we have this, where we started to restrict how this culture is actually utilized. But then, in the 20th century, we all had these tools which were democratized. People suddenly got the control over what they expressed, what they created, and what was the culture which resulted from that. The commons, who have always been around, then came together to save the world from failed sharing, as I call it. Now these people said, everything is about collaboration. We want to work together. We want to put things together. And we want to share it. We want to <coughs> share it out for other people to copy it, to modify it, to redistribute it. But as usual, I'm a lawyer, but we are famous for creating hurdles for most people. Law was in their way. So we got some clever lawyers from different parts of the world. Actually, they're from the same part of the world. <laughs> uh, and to actually enable the creator to say that, you know what, this is the freedom I want to run with my work. Here, take it. You want to work with me? Come. You don't want to work with me because you just don't like me, but you like my product. Take it. Work on it. Create something out of it. Redistribute something. Make better. So he comes, St. Canusius, actually, starts <coughs> in 1983. He realizes that he's not going to be part of the proprietary part. So he decides to start the Free Software Foundation, and the GNU operating system comes into existence. He says, when he has elaborated, what are the four freedoms with the GPL comes up with? He says, you deserve to use the software, which is free from any kind of restriction, where you are free to share it, copy it, learn, adapt, do whatever you want with it. You deserve free software. People say, yes, there is a need, there is a project. So we will find out, we will give a proof of the concept, we will put running code on it, and this is all what you get. But then, this enters. <coughs> Anything which is covered by copyright is also covered by Creative Commons. So these people lay down the infrastructural groundwork for a new shared economy, an economy which is based on freedom-empowered technology. So you have creativity, and you have connection, internet. You have some access, and you have some control. And then you have communities, and you have content. So these communities develop around the content, and you have the legal framework, which encourage these communities to come together, collaborate, and create what they want to do. So it leads to the sharing economy, which of course has huge impact in social, political, and economic subject fabric. That's why we're all here to discuss. And it leads to this. The commons become, have become now a strategic producer. They, have, they are an actor, not a passive consumer, but they're actually producers. Our output is unparalleled to our input. We've talked earlier about what has Linux come to today. It's also a provider of human experience. In that sense, it has become an activist. We actually appeal to that yearning in every human being which wants to connect and work with the other people. We create the thrill of working together and having a conjoined creation. Also, commons and democracy are natural allies. Also, democracy gets an enlightened ally, which is usually not its luck. And it's surprising why capitalism thought that 
democracy thought capitalism was its natural ally. But it is actually the commas. The, needs, the need for a self-government is what we talk about. And that's what democracy enforces. In fact, if we didn't have all this freedom, we wouldn't have this. I hope it really works the way they would. Yes, we can. So what are we doing here? I worked for the Software Freedom Law Center in the US for some time. But what am I actually doing here? Yeah, we've all heard this. And uh, sometimes it works, and sometimes it does not work. But everybody wants to talk about it. And we really, really know that there is a lot of truth in this statement. So in India, we are doing basically three things. So because commons, the legal strategy, the technology, the technological <coughs> strategy, and the politics, they're so intertwined that we cannot separate them. So my legal strategy is also my political strategy and also my technological strategy. We're doing three things in India. We're doing development. We're going to do some resistive action in India. And we're also doing some education and adoption. When it comes to development, of course, software is the area I particularly work in. We are a little ahead of the curve in India. Unlike New York, our primary strategy is not here to work for the free software projects. Not because we don't want to work, but we do not find a lot of free software projects, independent free software projects, which are under development in India. So our current work is helping the enterprises, the businesses, the businesses that enable other businesses to distribute, to uh, use free software deployment, to distribute it, <coughs> all the licensing issues, etc., to help lawyers <coughs> understand what is the legal framework which makes this collaborative economy possible, and educational institutions where our engineers are, our lawyers are, going to make it possible, whatever has been laid out to you in the morning. <coughs> These are the services SFLC provides, mostly the legal services to the free and open source software community. We do licensing, we do license defense and litigation support, since we are all lawyers. We do trademark counseling. We do patent defense, because we definitely get sued somewhere or the other. Then there is nonprofit organizational assistance. Most of the projects, we try to organize them in a nonprofit structure, because that makes it easy for them to give out what they have created. And we do public education, legal consulting, and also lawyer training. Can you see that? There is this paper plane up there, and people wondering whether the other plane can take off or not. And this guy says that I understand the basic patterns are held by some school child. We ran into this problem a lot of times. So we thought we will do this. We will have some resistive action here. There will be some progressive dismantling of the patent law. Unfortunately, patent law is here to stay. But how it stays is a matter of great importance. Among the BRIC or the BRICS countries, whatever you want to talk, call them, depending on whether we want to add the last nation or not, there is a budding coalition of economies, growing economies, who not only oppose the current global environment and restrictions, but are also gearing up for a new global order, which is going to dominate the 21st century, unlike the 20th, which was dominate, dominated by one party. And so we're going to also call, um, coordinate with the other partners and talk about the modification <coughs> of the global trade law. The progressive dismantling of patent law, I'm going to come back to it later in detail, how we're going to do that. There is also this thing about the recognition of government's right to share, the deployment of free and open source software, and anything the government makes can be shared. Mrs. Neely Cruz, who's been popular and famous for other things, but also <coughs> said this summer, she was the ex-commissioner of the European Competition Commission, that it is for the governments and our municipalities to decide who controls our technology. And her advice was to every government that not to get locked down into one kind of proprietary technology <coughs> ever. She recommended open standards and other things, but that's for the details. And there is countering monopolization of education. We've seen a lot of multinationals think it's a great idea to embed their products into the educational curriculum. 
which means that you provide software assistance, <coughs> you provide education, you provide a lot of training, and also some other material assistance, which I do not have to really name, you guys all understand, to, uh, to make us all depend on it. We have the education, which put into class. Okay, I click on this, I click on this, I get this. But this is a new system, I just don't understand how to click or where to click to understand this system. That's the kind of education we actually impart these days. So our idea is to counter that monopolization. I do not represent anybody except the commons and the free and open source software projects. So I, my interest is in getting rid of the monopoly and just letting people understand as to what education is. That's what Professor Sen talked in the morning. So some people think it's, we should just, opposing something means that we should oppose everything about it. But that's actually just talk. And it doesn't get work done. So I have to fight the system with its own tools and make my lawyer money on the other side, probably. So the Patents Act in India is, is a great piece of legislation. I love it. It's great. Section 21J says invention means a new product or a process involving an in inventive step and capable of industrial application. Patent means a patent for any invention granted under this act. I don't understand this definition. If I, if I didn't go to law school, I would say, what does patent really mean? But that's how laws are. So three cases, the following are not inventions within the meaning of this act. A mathematical or business method. Or computer 